next session is called Front and Centre, Growth Prospects for Emerging Cities Within China. And to discuss that, I have three colleagues from the Economist Intelligence Unit joining me on stage. Uh, Dr. Li Quan, um, I've introduced her twice already, but only in breakout sessions, so if it's possible that you will not have met her yet. So just to explain um, that Quan is the uh, Deputy Director of our China Forecasting Service, Access China, um, and in that capacity, she's in charge of all of the forecasting that we do of provinces and cities within China, and we forecast 287 cities here, so both in terms of demand and demographics, but also in terms of some of the supply side variables and some of the industrial assessments that we make uh, trends on the ground. Um, joining her on stage will be two colleagues who run um, our bespoke research services around the world. Um, Manoj Voira, um, who is the Director of Custom Research in Asia, he's based in Singapore, and Phil Todd, who's the Director of Custom Research Services in Europe, Middle East and Africa, and he's based in London. Both of them have an enormous amount of experience in the research um, business, both for us and pre prior to that in a previous career. So Manoj prior to working for us, um, ran a research business based out of India, looking at opportunities within the India market. Um, Phil, prior to working for us, um, ran a research business that was very much focused on global opportunities in the telecommunications and technology space. Both of them have an enormous amount of, of experience in strategic advice, helping companies with market entry and market sizing, benchmarking opportunities across multiple destinations. And I think that they're very appropriate people to join Louise in having a discussion about the relative merits of different cities and provinces within China in terms of the growth potential that they may offer your business. So please, if you'd like to all come on stage. Cover China is not just enough to cover China from a national perspective, but at least equally important, we need to talk about China from a regional perspective because China is so big. Talking about China without going to the different part of China is like talking about the entire Europe without talking about the differences between the French and the Greeks and the Germans. So here we are. Now, if you see this chart, you can easily see what I mean. Um, as you can see, for instance, just the simple city of Shanghai is entire GDP is that the size of the entire Finland. Um, the similar countries along the coastal, uh, similar provinces along the coastal lines, for instance, uh, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, they were the entire size of um, entire Austria, if not um, Switzerland. So that was very impressive. And that's why when we set up the service, and then two years ago we expanded the service, and now we cover actually all the 287 prefectures in China. Um, well, I need to correct myself when I say all the 287 cities, because that was the case until last year when the Chinese government decided to launch the new 288th uh, city called Sansha in uh, South China Sea. For now, there isn't any GDP or any macro uh, accountants on that, so we'll still for now call it all the 287 prefectures. In any case, this is how you can see where the fastest growing cities in China. Um, to tell you that some of the cities we've been seeing, their average GDP growth have been a real 20 to 30 percent in the past several years' time. Now, we did analysis on this, and we call it the champ city, standing for the champions. And you can see many of these cities, um, the darker color, the faster they grow. Um, some of them, or many of them, are actually in the inland regions rather than along the old coastal provinces here where we better know as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the reasons why these regions are so popular or are growing so fast is because they offer much cheaper wages compared to the coastal provinces. Um, now, we're talking about provinces such as Henan, Anhui over here. Um, and that means a lot of the traditional manufacturing hubs, they can just um, shift their manufacturing base to these provinces um, and then move everything over there. And the good thing is that the infrastructure in these regions are relatively good, which means it's pretty easy for them to shift their production base. Um, on top of that, it's also important to know that the local government very much welcome these, um, uh, especially the foreign direct investment along these lines. And, and third, uh, importantly, is that some of these regions, they actually offer very good um, wages and talent stories 
um, which was one of the sessions we covered this morning. The idea is, for instance, in the inland province of Anhui, they've got some really good um, universities. We're talking about, for instance, uh, the Zhongguo Kezi Daxue, which is known for producing many of the young and talented geniuses. So with that into the picture, uh, many companies are actually choosing and they prefer to move into the inland regions. Um, the other part would be over here, um, many cities in the northeast of China. Now they used to be where all the heavy uh, machinery and heavy industry were based. And right now the national government is talking about the revitalization of that entire area. And we're seeing that um, the GDP growth there is phenomenal. Uh, the spending pattern there is also quite impressive. And on top of that, we're seeing that, for instance, in Liaoning, their FDI are, are actually one of the fastest growing in China. So with all th these into picture, it's very clear to see that really the fast moving cities are no longer along the coastal provinces. Um, What's really driving this? One of them is hyper-urbanization. Now we know that back in 2011, for the first time ever, urban population became a majority in China. Um, and we expect that there will be another 86 million people moving from the rural area to the urban area by 2020. And that would be probably the largest human migration ever. And if you do the math, that's more than an entire London. There's more than an entire New York moving from the rural area to the urban area. So that would be phenomenal. And of course, with the new leadership, the Chinese leadership coming onto board, we saw that the new Chinese premier is calling for urbanization big time. Now, migration would be one of the key themes there. Another one uh, I'd like to share, um, Robin shared part of this. Um, he sort of already gave you the story, but here's the detailed look at it. Um, we chose the cities who have average disposable income of more than 30,000 RMB. The reason we choose that is this is approximately about 5,000 US dollars. If you do international comparisons, you will find that somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 US dollars is really when the private consumption story become more of a majority story in a country. Country, um, and where people would prefer to spend a lot. Now, as rich as you think China is, among all the 287 prefectures, only one city, Dongguan, in um, the province of Guangdong in 2009 passed through that out of the entire 287. And as rich as you think Shanghai is, only in 2010 did they pass through this threshold. And as rich as you think Beijing is, only in 2011 did it pass through. If I could go back a little. So we started with the city of Dongguan in the old traditional manufacturing hub. It was in, Guang, uh, Guang, uh, in the province of Guangdong, right next to Hong Kong. There were a lot of cheap stories, a lot of light manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. And then we see some more coastal cities starting to emerge. And then until when Beijing appeared. So more along the Yangtze River Delta uh, and Pearl River Delta. And then in 2012, for the first time, we see that some more inland cities are now actually in the picture. So these two are actually in the uh, province of Inner Mongolia, where there's a lot of mine stories, where you probably heard about the story of the ghost town, et cetera, et cetera, which isn't quite the, the case. Um, but I won't go into that today. Anyhow, so we believe that in 2013, these will be the cities passing through this threshold. And you can see more inland cities. And then for 2014, we see some actually to the west and into the northeast. 2015, 2016, more to the west inland, 2017, 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the, the one to the far left, that is um, uh, in Xinjiang. So this really gives you the idea how fast these cities are moving. Um, and basically, we pick out 20 cities among them. And right now, their average disposable income is that very similar or identical to the national average level. And that these 20 cities, for them, the average disposable income will be able to pass through this critical uh, threshold in three to four years' time already. And that means, in a way, for China as a whole, in three or four years' time, this would be the key story. So for instance, if you are in retail sectors, if you're trying to tackle down the private consumer powers in China, you've got three to four years of window opportunity to set up your business for people to know about where you're operating. Um, and before you know it, all the inland, the northeast, and the west provinces, they will become your new market. 
Um, and to, oops, sorry, to conclude that um, wages will be very important story in China, but um, that would be one of the contributing factors to the whole consumer power story. So for China, as I was arguing, um, income growth and um, urbanization, that would be the most important themes for China. Now, the new government talks about the rebalance of its economy. Um, to avoid the hard landing right now, um, of course, a proper level of investment will still be needed. But three to five years down the road, in the medium term, the government really need to work harder on rebalancing its economy towards more of a private cons uh, consumption story rather than the current investment-driven story. And with that, I'll turn uh, the microphone to my two colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Can, you, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. I, I'll make three uh, very fundamental points. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to make three very fundamental points. Um, one is, uh, you know, we all know that the economic center of gravity is shifting from the west to the east. This is very well documented. Uh, but, you know, the most important source of this shift has been urbanization. You know, never ever in the history of the modern economy we have seen urbanization at such a rapid scale and in such a massive way as we've seen in the last two decades. And, of course, China has been one of the main drivers of that shift in, uh, in Asia. Now, you know, if you, if you look at the current pace of urbanization in China, and if you look at next 20 years, China may have close to 1 billion people living in cities. So you have 1 billion people living in cities, higher productivity, rising income levels. The economic power of cities you know, becomes like, like many, many engines that will be driving the Chinese economy. And you know, already, if you look at uh, today, China has about 20 cities with GDP more than $100 billion. Uh, a decade back, not even a single city would have qualified to be a part of that club. You know, not even Shanghai, not even Beijing. And in next 10 years, not even 10 years, by 2020, there will be 70 cities which will have a GDP of more than $100 billion. And many of them will have more than $500 billion. Shanghai will be an $800 billion market by 2020. Now, that is massive. So when an investor is looking at Asia, it's not looking at China. It's now comparing cities in China to cities in Indonesia, cities in India, and trying to make investment decisions. And this is where the economic power of cities start playing a very, very important role. So it is not surprising when we hear more and more uh, business planners and uh, managers uh, want to know more about cities, where they will be in the next five years and next 10 years. This is the underlying reason. They have become sort of engines of growth in their own right. The second point I want to make is about the rise of inland cities. You know, Louise made that point, how the income levels are going to grow. Uh, but I want to address a very fundamental issue here. Yes, you know, they are growing at a rapid pace and partly because of a lower base. Uh, but in many ways, if you look at some of those inland cities, they are leapfrogging. And when I say leapfrogging, <coughs> You know, they are now attracting investment in many of the sectors which five, ten years back you would have expected to go to coastal regions. You know, solar panel manufacturing, PC manufacturing, semiconductor chip, they're all now beginning to go into the inland city like Chengdu and Chongqing. Now, that is very, very important because while some of the investment, you know, because of the rising costs in coastal regions, labor-intensive manufacturing will spill over. These, some of these cities in the inland will also drive a lot of knowledge-related investment in the coming years. That is very, very critical. And why not? These cities have an inherent advantage. You know, if you look at the urbanization rate, which was the key driver of the growth for inland cities, is going to play an equally, equally important role here. The urbanization rate for inland cities is relatively lower. What does this mean? This means two things. One, you will have a larger <coughs> reserve of workers available from the rural areas which are ready to be deployed in factories. Second, you know, 
once they are deployed, income levels will rise, and these cities' economic power will rise as well, and then they're going to become consumer centers. Now, you know, one is factory, shop workers. The other is the knowledge economy. You know, I made the point about you know, some of the investment of the knowledge sector going into these economies, and there is a very important reason for that, which is if you compare the enrollment rates for secondary and tertiary education, you will be surprised to know that they are churning out graduates at a comparable rate as Shanghai and Beijing. So in five to 10 years from now, many of these cities will be challenging the economic might of some of those established coastal regions, and they're going to come up at a very, very fast clip. My last point is, you know, China is an enormous country, and these shifts are happening at a much faster pace than anyone had expected. Now, it's very easy for biz business managers to look at this and say, all right, everyone's going inland, we need to go inland. But these shifts will mean different things to different people. Now, you know, we, we have a client uh, that my team has been working with for the last three years, and the client is in the business of uh, manufacturing uh, high-end office furniture. Now, high-end office furniture, we found, had a very high correlation with the way services sector GDP was going to grow. So this client of ours is not going to find demand in cities where there's a lot of manufacturing that's going to drive the growth. It's going to be the services sector. Now, if I take the example of another client, which is a beverage maker, clearly it's more urbanization, more income levels, more employment, those kind of things that are driving. So the point I'm trying to make is, while at the macro level, it's good to look at these mega trends, every sector and every company will have to make sense of these trends in their own way. These opportunities are profound and these are still evolving. Uh, what companies make out of these would entirely depend upon how you interpret those. And I think that's going to be the key things for companies in the coming decade. Thank you. Um, I want to bring just a little bit of a context uh, from clients based in my area, which is uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, to pick up on some of the points that Manoj has just said, uh, the rise and growth of cities in China has, has been brought to their attention. These cities are becoming visible in, the, in their own right. And this has a number of consequences for these companies when they're looking at um, where to invest, how to, how to grow their businesses. Um, the first is that obviously they will start to see Chinese cities as markets for, for them in their, in their own right. Um, this is what you see in other parts of the world. Um, within my area, there's a lot of work we do within Africa, for instance, where companies don't look at Africa, they look at cities, and a, it's a city-based strategy, and you see the same here in China as well. Uh, they're looking at Chinese cities as discrete markets, and looking at the data within those cities in order to understand which ones are going to be the right, right for them. Um, for these sort of uh, cities and, and clients, we do work around market sizing um, and market forecasting so that they can understand and compare which markets again, which cities are going to be the best ones for them. Examples again are around sort of uh, FMCG and beverages, things like that, but also around healthcare where companies are looking at where to expand and where, where to grow the, their businesses. Um, another interesting example would also be we've worked quite closely with um, several companies in the luxury goods market. And there again, it's looking at um, cities in quite detailed demographic and population growth, expenditure, income. Um, but for companies like that, they need to go beyond just that sort of data. Uh, they, need, they need to look at, at, at a really quite micro level. They are just, I'm trying to understand not just which cities have got that right demographic profile, which parts of the cities are right, even right down to which streets are right. Um, and they're looking for real granular information so they can understand how to build that into their, their development and growth plans. Other consequences of this sort of uh, increased visibility um, are that companies are asking us about cities providing insight into innovation and new market trends. They're not just looking at Chinese cities as another growth opportunity, but looking to get learning points from how those cities are, are using products, are growing, are changing how, the, how, they're, how they're developing. Um, so we need to, from our point of view, we're researching cities alongside um, other sources of insight so that they can start to see Chinese cities as trendsetters um, and using that information to help refine their own 
positioning in the market and their own products and services. Um, we've, for instance, been working with a, a very large healthcare client in, in Europe where they're looking at um, not Chinese cities as a, as a market, but trying to understand how consumers are viewing healthcare, healthcare services and products, um, and how those, how those uh, attitudes towards healthcare things are uh, evolving over time and how they're changing so that they can start to try and get ahead of the curve and, and position themselves correctly for the future. Um, we've also done work in terms of uh, logistics and transportation, trying to understand how uh, the growth of Chinese cities is changing the, the, the logistics map. Um, we do work, for instance, looking at how uh, trade flows around the world have changed and are evolved over the last 50 years. Um, and how the trade has moved from being uh, north-south and south-north to east-west and west-east and then east-east. And these are being driven by growth in, in very local markets. Um, but the, the last point I want to make is that it's, it's wrong just to think that companies are looking at Chinese cities in isolation. Um, they're looking at cities uh, alongside other destinations around the world as well. So they're looking at wanting to benchmark cities against other ch cities within China, but also against other destinations around the world. So they're looking at benchmarking Chinese cities against um, Rio, against Delhi, against um, Lagos, to understand where is their best market going to be coming from in the future. Um, is it just that there's a right market there? Uh, or is it actually they need to start thinking about their, their business model? Um, as Chinese cities change and grow, you're seeing a change in, uh, in the cost base, a change in, the, in the, the actual size of that local market, a change in the competitive environment as well. Um, that is forcing our clients in Europe, when they're looking at Chinese cities, to, to reevaluate how, not just which market to go for, but have their entire uh, process chain, if you like, as to are they doing things correctly now, because the whole, the whole situation is evolving uh, as, as they're going along. So it becomes quite a dynamic situation that, that they're looking at. Right, so cities is something we've been talking about a lot, and as I was saying, even for China, so we started on national level and then on regional, um, on provincial level, and then to cities. But um, do all the clients actually interested in, in, in cities, or do they, some of them would be more interested in a city cluster, or some of them uh, might be interested even uh, deep down inside, for like county level or something, have you encountered clients with requests as such? Absolutely, no, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, no, both ways, you know, uh, when clients look at uh, cities within a country, uh, they do ident try and identify clusters and try and sort of make their hub, uh, you know, to service that entire, entire region, if you want to call it, in a, in a customized way. Uh, but increasingly, you know, Clients that, that sell, say, luxury products or want to open a restaurant, they go even further down. You know, they want to break down city into districts mm. and counties and want to see, you know, you know how a consumer behaves, how a consumer <coughs> uh, spends his day, uh, you know, where, uh, to the detail. So that all is beginning to happen, and technology is allowing that. You know, technology allows you uh, to pinpoint you know, all these activities, technology allows you to track consumers now. Uh, that is all is beginning to happen where all this work will come uh, sort of in the more form of more integrated uh, assessment of where the opportunities could be. I think that's right. I think the, the other point, building on that, um, certainly when, when we talk to clients about looking at the uh, China and Chinese cities, and this is echoed in how they look at other, other regions as well, um, they're not diving in uh, sort of regardless, they take a very, seem to take a very cautious and measured approach. Um, the, the parallel I would draw is that when we work in, in Africa, we work with clients who will uh, make a bridgehead into Johannesburg or Cape Town as a starting point in order to understand the larger environment and understand that city, but also where to go next. So they're using one city as their bridgehead into the country um, but also then to gain more local knowledge, understand themselves how, that, how the cities work in, in that country, yeah. um, and then plan the strategy on from there. So 
So it, it is, as, as you say, it's a, it's a very detailed, cautious, step-by-step -step, and very granular approach. Because right. um, it, it, it can cost a lot of money and they want to get it right. And although it's a competitive market and there's some degree of wanting to get ahead of the competition, it's more expensive if you get that wrong. And it's better to actually do it carefully and do it right. Right. But cities is, is but absolute, cities the is trend. absolutely where it is. Right. And as Manuel said, it's not just cities, it's subsections of cities, it's regions within cities, mm. um, it's the districts. districts, it's where the high net worth streets. individuals, where is where's shopping happening, uh, where are certain demographic living. It, right. It's right at that sort of level, it's sort of like geo mapping of the demographic data. Mm. I see. And, and as I said, you know, the the sheer economic weight. You know, I, I gave the example of uh, China having uh, 20 cities with more than $100 billion of GDP. You know, out of 200 countries in the world, only, and, only 60 countries have GDP of more than $100 billion. Now, that tells you how large cities have become. You know, they are bigger than countries, most countries. And that is why, you know, investors are now beginning to look at, you know, let me not compare country X and country Y. Let me compare top six cities in India with, with top six cities in China, with Brazil. And that is how they're looking at it. So it's absolutely cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then to follow up on what we talk about, you know, doing business in China, what, when, when working with um, different clients, what do you see are the biggest challenges, if not difficulties, when working on these? Um, from my perspective, the greatest single challenge is um, availability of data and comparability of data. So when we're, whenever we're working with, at, at this level of granularity, um, we find actually you, you, you can't immediately do that sort of comparison because you haven't got a complete set of data in terms of um, macroeconomics or demographics or whatever it might be. At, when you're trying to stratify by age and, and all these sort of things, you'll find that there, are, there simply are data gaps. Um, and one of the things we then have to cope with is well, how do you fill those gaps so you have a complete data set and you're into modeling and, and things like that. But then you also need to say, well, if I want to compare cities, I need to make sure I'm comparing the right data in this city with the same data same in another city. So that sort of, it's a then comes the question of definitions and making sure uh, as researchers and, and advisors to the companies that we've got apples and apples and pears and pears, as right. they would say. Um, and it is a real issue, and it is a, a real difficulty. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. But you know, we are lucky in, in, in Asia, we have Louis here. So we manage to... <laughs> we deal with Chinese down, data every day. So. We <laughs> need down uh, those constraints. And you know, that, that reminds me of an interesting uh, incident or a case that we had. So we had this client who had heaps of data on Chinese outbound travelers. So you know, where are Chinese traveling to? Where do they travel? And they wanted to make sense of that data, you know, to predict, you know, which cities uh, they will see more and more Chinese traveling to and which cities in the world they will go to. And, you know, when we had a look at data, uh, it was patchy, you know, it, it needed uh, a lot of work, uh, but we managed to overcome it. And, you know, the, the kind of insights that it reveals is absolutely fascinating. So while data issues do exist, but I think increasingly we are seeing that, you know, we managed to get around those. Data availability from government sources is improving, as we see, uh, and that is helping. So, but for me, the, the, the one key challenge is, uh, in China is, you know, more and more clients are now looking at uh, uh, China and, and saying the cost is rising of, of producing my, my good, and I need to move. And sometimes I see that the whole focus is on just looking at the labor costs. And you know, we keep looking at and keep advising that the cost of manufacturing uh, is one thing, but the cost of operation is another. Uh, you, know, you have to take into account several factors. So in many ways, you know, going through that motion and explaining the whole thing uh, can be a bit challenging you know, right. for, for clients who are solely focused on, on manufacturing costs. Mm -hmm. I hope they're actually sitting here today listening to us by saying cheap labor, labor is no longer just the story about China. There's so much more that China offers. Um, with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, oh, yes, please.
Wait, wait. So in the spirit of Sitel, I'll try to Sorry, make... will you please identify yourself? Yeah, Li Wei Wang from Caixin Media. So I will try to be uh, critical in the spirit of Sitel. Uh, on Dr. Liu's first, uh, third slides, you mentioned the fastest growing city in China. Um, I guess that must be based on the um, percentage increase. I noticed the cities like Baotou and Jiaozhou are actually very small in absolute size. So do you think in this occasion, um, absolute increase might be more relevant for companies trying to get a share of the growth in China? And second question for Menoj. Um, you talked about the big promise of the urbanization process. Um, yes, the urbanization has been remarkable in the past uh, 10, 20 years, and the promise of inland cities are huge. Um, but as many has rightly pointed out, um, the urbanization of China has been mostly urbanization of land, not urbanization of people. The 50% urbanization rate is um, actually a bit inflated. The real urbanization rate actually is 35% if you doesn't count the migrant workers. Of those people, um, their spending power is very limited because they don't have the um, social safety net. Um, their houses are cheap and shattered on the outskirts of the city. So do you think if the current model of urbanization in China doesn't change, and for that matter, the central government and local government doesn't make any policy adjustment, Will the urbanization in China hold the promise as you just mentioned? Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, you, uh, the first question you um, raised a very important issue. Uh, yes, so that chart was um, mostly on uh, GDP growth, and that is only one side of the story. And in fact, that is uh, a side of the story where it's one of the first ones we need to consider, but one that Chinese government tend to emphasize too much. Apart from that, um, when we do city ranking, we do take into account of many other factors. For instance, um, on top of real GDP, you got to have to consider the uh, population trend. Is it an, an aging society in that particular city? For instance, we're seeing that for Shanghai, almost 20% of its entire metropolitan uh, population uh, are um, at least uh, age of 65, if not older. And for CN, this number is uh, almost 25%. So, so these are the things that we also need to take into account. And then also, of course, um, income growth, that is something. And then the local business environment. Um, and nowadays, more and more, you know, for instance, people talk about pollutions um, and the other infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure, labor market, is it flexible or is it rigid? So um, when we do the other city rankings, we do tend to um, uh, take into account of all of these rather than just GDP. But that was just to kick off the conversation where we're seeing the fastest growth. So obviously, for dis different business, um, as Manoj was also saying, um, they are looking at different things. Some business um, are looking into the, um, uh, the income growth level. Some are, are more looking at maybe the commercial property market. So, so it's quite different. So we need to do the ranking in a different way. Uh, to answer your question on urbanization, a very relevant question. Yes, it has been the urbanization of the land, uh, you know, centered around a few cities, uh, migrant workers coming in, um, absolutely. And that is why it is so important to observe the phenomenon of inland cities now developing, you know, where migrant workers possibly will go back or will stay where they are. Uh, very, very critical. But that said, you know, the phenomenon of urbanization of land is not unique to China. You know, if you, if you look at the world and if you pick major urban centers, you will always see, you know, they will attract population and workers from around the area. You know, Tokyo, uh, you know, has, you know, a world's largest sort of metropolis, you know, attracts people from all over the Tokyo, all around Tokyo. So that is, that is a phenomenon that is universal. But that said, you're absolutely right. If inland cities do not grow at the pace, you know, at which the government expects, or we would like, uh, urbanization has a downside. You know, it puts pressure on resources. We're already seeing that, you know, air, healthcare, transportation. It also has, you know, if, if it doesn't, if you don't address these for, for, for many years, it has, you know, even social risks. So 
those things exist, but I don't think those are the scenarios we're looking at China for now. Uh, we do expect inland cities to grow at a rapid pace, uh, you know, looking, by, looking at their current performance. I think, uh, you know, we will see uh, more and more migrant workers staying where they are and possibly even going back. And that sort of becomes a distrib redistribution of China's urbanization dividend, as, as I would call it. We have time for another very quick question. Robbie. <laughs> a microphone here, please. Maybe if I just tell you. Yeah. Um, talks a lot about opportunities in cities, and I, mean, I think we can see how you quantify those, um, by, you know, those issues. But there are a lot of challenges in some of these cities as well. Um, infrastructure's not so good. Um, just saying, I think we can see there's opportunity in these, these cities in the West, um, and we can quantify that if you get over the data problems, and we've heard a bit about how you might go about doing that. But the operating environment in these cities can be quite challenging too, so the infrastructure is perhaps not so developed, um, the local politics is quite opaque and difficult to understand, and businesses need to make choices about where they go based not just on the opportunities, but those kind of impediments to, to taking advantage of those opportunities. And just wondered if you give some pointers as to how firms can go about doing that in a structured way, because the, the size of the market, that's very clearly quantified. These other issues are not. And how do you combine those two to form a decision about where the right places to go? When uh, many of the times when we try to quantify the opportunities versus the risk, um, it depends on different clients who, how they want to emphasize uh, to side. But when it comes to risk, certainly, um, for instance, me, even though many of the companies are choosing to move inland um, and that they receive a lot of preferential policy from the local government, some of them still choose not to go or actually go back to the traditional coastal provinces. And the very reason being that the local regulation environment isn't good enough. Um, the transparency of the entire government versus business environment is still not quite good compared to many of the coastal provinces. So that's one of another reason that um, business need to be mindful of. Um, so that said, when we try to quantify them, um, we, there are times where we would be doing a scenario analysis. Um, it depends on different kind of risk. It could be um, now for some of the beverage companies, they would be looking at weather. Um, other companies would be looking at social unrest. Now we saw how um, Xinjiang had an, a, a, a big um, disruption uh, to many of the local business there. Um, so all these things would be the uh, consideration that we need to take into account, apart from the regular sort of standard default outcomes that we would be advising the companies of. Yeah, just to, just to build upon Luz's point, uh, you know, it, it's, it's never the opportunity. It's always the net opportunity. So you have the market size, you have the income levels, you have the population. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you have to take into account infrastructure, regulatory issues, uh, you know, supplier ecosystem, so on and so forth. Uh, but what I what I uh, what I have seen in, in you know in my discussions with, with clients who are already in China, it, it's not about packing their bags you know from from coastal regions and going into one of the inland cities. It's about fine you know let's set up a small facility, let's set up a small operations, and then grow from there. Uh, and as they gain more experience and they get more comfortable, we have seen you know that uh, many a times uh, the risk factor uh, that we assessed, or they looked at earlier, uh, was, wasn't that. You know, they were able to create the ecosystem of suppliers around it. And, and that is why you've know, seen you know, Intel going to Chengdu with, with such a large facility, or, or solar panel facility going to Chongqing. And then you see after two years, you know, a whole ecosystem has come up. So the initial success stories are, are quite positive. But you're right, it, it's about that opportunity. And many of these cities are, are still not there yet in terms of infrastructure or regulatory maturity. The only other point I would add to that, I, I guess, is um, whenever I, I talk to clients about this sort of uh, investment, it, it's, a, it's, it's a balanced decision. There, there's a cost, there's a benefit. Um, the intangibles are, are quite hard to, to build into those sort of evaluations uh, because you're looking at 
an idea around, it can be um, political or economic instability, uh, regulatory issues, um, and at the end of the day, they, um, they have to take a view as to how, how to handle those sort of issues and what sort of time scale they're going to be looking at these over. And as you were saying, that it may well be that there, there's, a, there's a, a phased approach to being able to cope with these sort of issues, um, but in the long run, uh, they'll, they'll see that the, the, the prize at the end of that run is worth the, the, that investment over a period of time. And it comes back to perhaps partly the point I was saying earlier as well, that companies tend to take a fairly measured and cautious view, um, but they'll, they'll make a, a bridgehead in one area and understand how, how things work locally uh, in order to make that better assessment themselves. As to, uh, at the end of the day, do, do those risks are they, are they manageable within that sort of a corporate environment that they particularly have, and to take those decisions that, that best suit uh, their, own, their own internal processes. Thank you. Uh, we're already running two minutes late, so I have to close the floor, but um, the, the three of us will be around if you need to speak to us later. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you.